privilege to introduce today Professor Igit Heshkovic from University of Haifa, Israel. There is no need for many words to present Professor Heshkovic, but I will say that uh, just for uh, the last three decades she's conducting research on child interview techniques and she's one of the founders of the NICHD protocol and uh, she's also conducting research in the broader field of child sexual abuse. She's also a trainer. She is uh, conducting training in numerous countries, uh, teaching investigators how to talk to children. And uh, related to that, from our experience here in Romania uh, with her, uh, we can say that she's not only a uh, extremely skillful trainer, but also an inspirational one, and we are deeply grateful for that. And uh, I will now invite you for her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, dear George, for your warm words. Um, so, I, after this introduction, I can start immediately. And I'll be speaking about the NICHD uh, um, protocol. It's an investigative interview protocol for children, which is developmentally sensitive. It means that it's adapted for children. And it has two versions till now, the basic one and the revised one. And today I will give some uh, background about the, the basic one, then move to describe research on the revised protocol, on the new elements introduced in the revised protocol, and um, the, some tests about the effects of this protocol, which also uh, have some implications um, about the mechanism, the potential mechanism that uh, mediate the effects of the protocol. So thank you for coming to this lecture, and I try to be as informative as I can. Uh, I would like to split the lecture into two parts, so that we ha I, ha I give first my presentation, and then we can discuss together some further issues, some open questions, some answered questions that we could discuss some more here. Uh, if you have your own question, you are welcome to, to raise them uh, after the first part. And if my accent is not very clear, it's because I am Israeli and I speak Hebrew. And if I'm unclear, please stop me. I'll be happy to repeat my words. Thank you. So just before I go into the research on the protocol, I would like a note of recognition and appreciation to many organizations who have introduced and established the use of the protocol in Romania as we are all visiting this wonderful place and be, being the, the, the guest of this institution, I would like to say in a few words how much I appreciate the, wor the work of several organizations who have done really an inspiring work in implementing this protocol in Romania. And it started in 2016 by the Federation of NGOs for Child Protection, um, also sponsored by the French Embassy. Then, since I was involved here lately, in the last year, uh, we had a two-phase project implementing the protocol. The first was uh, training two groups, one of psychology, some of them are here, hello. And the other is a group of prosecutors, hello Irina. 
this training was implemented by the VIS, the Association for Victims of Sexual Crimes. This is an NGO uh, working for two years, um, trying, making immense uh, efforts to improve justice for children, for abused children. Then we are active now in the second phase of this project, only with prosecutors. Uh, and we have a follow-up training, a one-year follow-up training, which consists of individual and group training to help them use more effectively the protocol. Hopefully, we would like um, this group to become, or maybe additional professional to become also trainer in the country so they can spread the knowledge and the skills and establish a better knowledge base for interviewing children in Romania. The, this later phase was implemented by the Justice for Children, Victim of Sexual Abuse. That's the name of the project, setting national standards in science-based investigation of sexual abuse against children. And this time it's training the trainer program. Uh, it is implemented by the Association for Victim of Sexual Abuse plus UNICEF in Romania. So my thanks and appreciation for your inspiring work. So let me talk a little bit about the original <coughs> NICHD protocol. So it was initiated at NICHD, which is the National Institute of Child Health at NIH, Maryland, uh, United States. Uh, the, at the time, this section was headed by Professor Michael Lamb, who is very knowledgeable in the area of child investigation. And this protocol was primarily targeted at enhancing children's cognitive processes during, during the investigative interview by increasing the number of retrieval prompts given to them that would elicit more recall than recognition. Recall is known as a, more, as a deeper process of uh, retrieval which affects positively the uh, the accuracy and the uh, uh, amount of knowledge obtained by uh, children, investigated children who are alleged victim of sexual abuse. So this is actually the main, the main strategy. Use open-ended questions that would bring more uh, information, more qualitative information, more accurate information. The second component of this protocol is uh, explaining the ground rules to the children so they understand the expectations and the demand of the foreign interview. Research has shown that when children understand the, the aim of the interview and the context in which it is perform, they, they do better and they are more informative. Then, um, one component that is part of this, the basic uh, protocol, but much more developed in the revised protocol, is the uh, rapport building. Uh, so establishing report is a, is a main practice in this protocol and we do, we suggest to do that in ways that children um, learn and practice recounting a narrative and then in this way we expect that their narrative competence would increase. Uh, another part is training episodic memory retrieval. We are aiming to retrieve them incidents of sexual abuse. So we want the child to be, to experience some of the questions that are helping to, to reach a, a chronological sequence of the, the event. So that when we reach the substantive event, 
I mean the event under investigation, so the child already knows how to recount this event without uh, too many uh, guidance. And as we want the uh, account to be as much, we want it spontaneous as much as possible, it's important to make all the preparation to the children before we get to the substantive part. So what we found when testing this protocol was that use of this protocol indeed allowed the interviewer to conduct more informative and uncontaminated investigative interviews. So we got interviews that uh, were composed of many more invitations, open-ended questions, as expected. And children reacted really good to these uh, types of questions, providing more and more accurate information. Uh, however, this protocol gave little attention to emotional and motivational factors that affect the behavior of the children in their interview. And this is an important issue because many suspected victims do not report their abuse when they are interviewed, even when we have clear evidence that abuse did occur. So uh, we realized that this is a portion of the children, a group of children, which is uh, actually a big group of children, sometimes consisting of 50% of the children who have difficulty um, disclosing the abuse. I present here the efforts we made during the past de decade um, to establish this protocol, to revise it, and to, to test the new revision. Uh, and I would say that while it was initially um, formulated f to, to um, cope with reluctant children, those who are not willing or who cannot really share their abuse, uh, it is working successfully um, with non-reluctant children. So we have some tests that include non-reluctant children as well. So I would say a little bit about the disclosure pro progress um, because this is part of what motivated us to include some uh, new elements in the protocol. So as I said, my, many children do not report their abuse and we know about several correlates of reluctance to, to disclose. One major correlate is the proximity to the suspect. And children who have been abused or suspected to be abused by uh, family figures are especially reluctant um, to disclose. So we focused actually in our efforts in the implementation and in the research on those children who are the most reluctant to see whether we can um, help them cope better with their reluctance and start telling us about their abuse. So we learned a little bit about the dynamics of uh, reluctance and some of what we learned is that those children are actually experiencing a lot of distress during their interview, potentially because of negative emotions toward the investigations, uh, fears of uh, saying the wrong words, fears of persecutions following their disclosure, feeling of guilt, of uh, embarrassment talking about sexual activities or sexual organs, uh, shame. So we actually realized that the children who are the most reluctant are also the most vulnerable. Vulnerable, okay. Children. And rather than being 
uh, urge to to disclose they need actually emotional support to cope with their negative emotions and reluctance. Following uh, this insight, uh, we did research to, to check whether um, forensic interviewer indeed provide more support to reluctant children and what types of dynamics characterize the, the interaction between reluctant children and their interviewer. So what we found when comparing reluctant and not reluctant children is that, <coughs> sorry, uh, is that um, interviewer indeed be behave differently, but not in the direction we expected. And what specifically we could observe is that they posed more questions to reluctant children, urging them to, to disclose. Uh, they posed fewer free recall prompts against all recommendations. Uh, and they, they gave fewer supportive statements. Also, it is clear that those children need more rather than less supportive statements. In turn, those children avoided uh, establishing rapport, building rapport with their interviewer, and they showed their reluctance early on in the interview. So from the very very start of the interview, children were showing nonverbal signs of reluctance as well as verbal, verbal signs. So we learned that actually if we observe the child at the very beginning of the interview, we learn a lot about his position and about his needs. And so we allowed some opportunity during the pre-substantive phase uh, and rapport building with the child to solve part of this, reluctant, this reluctance to provide support uh, to enable a better rapport and better emotional expression by the child so he can hopefully express and then um, solve some of his negative emotions and then move to um, to cooperate in the substantive part of the interview. Here are the three elements we added to the, to the basic NICHD protocol. Uh, the NICHDR is for revised, and it was revised to include a deeper uh, rapport between uh, and more meaningful rapport between the child and the interviewer, more emotional expression by the child, and more social and emotional support by the interviewer. I'll talk a little bit about rapport building. Uh, I'd say that many researchers have highlighted Um, how rapport can facilitate children's effective participation in interviews. Uh, how rapport help the children build trust, uh, and then they become more cooperative before we start exploring the substantive event under investigation. As I said, because we can identify early on in the interview signs of reluctance and mistrust, uh, this phase of the rapport building is very, very important to try and solve some emotional issues because before we move to the, uh, to the real interview. Uh, this time, the rapport building is not just a list of prompts or questions that we, we address to the child, but it is a deeper interactive uh, process where the interviewer is supposed to uh, constantly monitor the child's 
position, the child's cooperation, and try and address more and more support to the children uh, to address their needs and to help them overcome emotional barriers. So this is what was added to the rapport element. Now about uh, emotional expression. So another aim of the, of the revised protocol was to add this component into it uh, because we know that emotional expression by children, not just by children, promotes well-being and predicts a range of positive outcome. Health outcome, academic achievement outcome, many, many types of outcome, all positively affected by, by emotional expression. Um, but we also know that emotional expression is actually a prerequisite for emotional processing and at the end emotional regulation. And this is the principle that we follow in this protocol. So we allow the child to express his emotion, we work some more on, on processing this, those emotion, tell me more about you being sad, um, so that the child can express some more and then solve, hopefully solve, his negative emotion, overcome his negative emotion and get to tell us. Despite the importance of expressing emotions and especially negative emotions, uh, research shows that children in investigative interviews rarely uh, express emotions. So we, one aim of this revision was to encourage ch children to express to express emotions, and I will show how it was done uh, and how this protocol provides opportunities uh, for emotional ex expression. But emotional expression is not just good for well-being, it's not just good for the child solving his, uh, his negative emotion, it's also a powerful factor for enhancing uh, memory. We know that emotional cues are a very strong cues to memory. So we expect that when children actually raise uh, their emotion and we reflect um, on them, we process them together with the child in non-suggestive way, uh, hopefully in open-ended prompts, then we can actually cue memory more effectively and get more information. So this has a double aim, making more, enhancing more the well-being of the child, but also enhancing the cueing to memory. We also have some evidence from neurophysiological uh, research showing that stronger and more negative stimuli associated with a stronger activation of the amygdala, uh, which is associated with recall of, of central details rather than peripheral details. So we have a strong base, a strong research base to encourage emotional expression. One more uh, finding that was especially relevant for the investigation is that emotional cueing can also help uh, the separation of events because it affects the, the separation pattern in the, in the brain. So this is also some neurophysiological uh, finding. So. Uh, those of you who perform investigative interview know that it is a big challenge when children experience a lot of events. It is a big challenge to make them focus on one event and provide specific details, specific rather than generic details on one event. But um, we expected that uh, emotional cueing would help with that.
Okay, here I have some examples of how we could encourage emotions, like containing the emotion, you told me you were sad, angry, I hear, I see what you're saying, exploring the emotion, you said you felt sad, angry, um, tell me more about that, how do you feel so far in our conversation, when the child didn't express spontaneously. Uh, we can show appreciation to the child when he's sharing emotion and then encourage him to do that more. Uh, so saying thank you for sharing your emotions with me, you're welcome to share some more. Uh, then um, uh, I, I'll show you later whether it helped, indeed, increase the emotional expression by those children. The third element included in the revised protocol is support by the interviewer, social and emotional support by the interviewer. It is well known and well established that in supporting interviewer can help reduce the child anxiety, mistrust, reluctance, promote emotional regulation, and is participation. However, uh, it's, there are concerns that uh, when providing support to children in investigative interview, it might become, it might turn, it might become suggestive or look as suggestive and then harm the case. So the big challenge with providing support in investigative interview is actually to find a way to provide much more support that is not suggestive. And how can that be done um, is by, for example, here we have some uh, strategies that can be used non-suggestively like empowering the child, reinforcing his efforts, but not contents, uh, not, not emotions. Uh, we are not supposed to confirm emotions or contents, just uh, efforts. Reassure when it is possible. We can't reassure the child that nothing bad will happen to his father, or that um, this, is, this will not happen anymore. Okay, but when it's possible, we can reassure the child. Uh, we should avoid tying support to specific tell statements, like saying thank you for telling me about what your father did while uh, we want to hear the global picture of the event. We don't want to reinforce specific contents by the child. Uh, we can be empathic to the child without any confirmation, as I said. We can reflect, contain, and invite elaboration on emotions. Uh, we can offer, offer availability, care, understanding, help to the child who is facing difficulty. Uh, when there is evidence, we can even show some concern. Don't think we have much time for uh, examples, but we have a long list of supportive strategies that we offer, and lots of publication of our publication include them, so it's pretty much uh, published. Uh, what is important is that we avoid inadequate interventions such as suggestive support, uh, unfounded support, or causing discomfort to the child, like criticizing the child, stopping the child, mentioning negative consequences of his him be, being quiet, or even referring to the child with the wrong name, which is really har uh, harming to the rapport uh, attempt. We also 
helped interviewer in this protocol, we guided interviewer how to avoid uh, how to avoid missing opportunity for providing support. So we set some rules which say that uh, whenever there is some emotional expression by the child of any type, which could be reluctance or negative emotions, but also positive emotion, because we don't want to selectively reinforce some type of emotions, uh, there is need for some supportive reaction by the interviewer. Uh, missing this opportunity to provide support would be called absence of adequate support. So this is the type of uh, feedback that we also give in training to the, um, to the interviewer. I will move uh, <coughs> quickly to describe tests <coughs> of the RP. And first, uh, addressing the rapport uh, process. Uh, one early test that we did almost um, a decade ago, compared the standard protocol to the revised protocol, where we saw that using the revised protocol, children were re less reluctant in the pre-substantive phase and in the substantive phase, and responded with less omissions, like saying, I have nothing to say, or I don't want I don't talk to you or just no answer. This revision of the protocol, it's, it's about time to say that, uh, was done in two phases. Actually, in the first phase, we provided the, the protocol to the interviewer without many specific um, guidance about how to use the, specific, the supportive interventions. Although we provided a list of interventions, uh, we didn't specifically guide exactly how to do that. And um, we also didn't teach them this um, principle of responding immediately to emotional uh, expressions by the child. So what we found after this first training was that indeed interviewer used more support, but not necessarily reactive support to the child. So they missed, in a, in a sense, they missed uh, the, the responsive uh, pattern that we were trying to uh, help them acquire. And following that, uh, they, they stopped using the support at the substantive phase. I mean, they started very well the interview, they built rapport, the child gave some allegation, then they felt relieved, and they stopped making the efforts of reinforcing the child's emotion and the child's uh, efforts. So we didn't see, following this training, uh, any effect on the quality, on the quantity of the interview, of the details during the substantive phase. So we moved on to detail more the, the guidance to the interviewer. And after some more efforts and some more training, um, we started seeing more reactive support by the interviewers, and we started to see more reduced reluctance in the substantive phase, which was accompanied with much more uh, forensic details. Okay, it was uh, also helpful to raise coherent statements when we tested that on three uh, dimensions, the context, the chronology, and the theme. Uh, and 
we could show that we got more information and more coherent forensic statements. After we um, ensured that there was some improvement in the dynamics of the interview between the reluctant children and their interviewers, uh, we went on to see whether it affects the allegation rates, whether children would be more willing to make allegations following the change in the um, dynamics of the interaction. And we used uh, uh, in two different tests, we used two different populations. Once it was reluctant children and the sample was validated with external evidence, so we knew that children were indeed abused. Then I'll show you another test with uh, a nationwide population. So, in the first test, we saw that over half of the children in the sample made allegations. This is the reluctant children, the very reluctant children. Uh, more doing so when they were interviewed using the RP, which was 60%, versus the SP, 50%. So we had almost 20% more allegation when using properly the uh, RP. Uh, on the second test, uh, we used a nationwide sample of 20,000 cases to show that we could replicate, even though the improve in allegation rate was slightly lower, it was still 13.3 more per, uh, percent more allegation made by children. Uh, interestingly, we also tested credibility assessment, meaning to what the child, um, to, what the inter to what extent the interviewer was able and confident to uh, assess credibility in the case, and there was a 9% increase in credibility assessment. Then the next question was how were allegations raised and we could see that those allegations that were raised with the RP were actually more spontaneous, meaning that they were raised with less prompting. Uh, then we saw that in RP interviews children provided more emotions and more emotions in more various categories of emotions. Okay, it's not just repeating the same emotion, but uh, enlarging the, the scope of emotional expression. And after, in several tests, we could see that and repeat this finding. Um, and later we tried to connect the, the emotional expression of the children to, to the level of informativeness, to the amount of forensically re relevant details, and there was a strong association. Uh, and the whole path where that support increased emotional expression, which in turn increased the level of informativeness. Okay, that's about it. And I raised some more questions that were difficult for us to cope with, and I thought addressing this um, question to you with the hope that we can have some more interactive discussion about how the protocol can be else implemented. So uh, given, given the, the difficulty and the partial um, results that I described before implementing the RP, uh, we wondered how the RP should be 
well implemented or properly implemented in the field and they would love to hear your insights and your uh, experience with implementation of the RP. Hi, Julia. Is, uh, should I use the microphone or can you hear me? Mm. <laughs> we hear you. Uh, I was curious as to, I think the sort of traditional part of the MSCHD is easily enough translatable across cultures with the focus on open-ended questions and equal memory, but all the parts that are related to social support, emotional support, I'm, I think much more cultural dependent, and I think it's not as easy to translate, for example, coming from Finland, I know that uh, things like repeating the child's name or asking the child to look you in the eyes be very strange or almost offensive. And I know uh, an alcohol writer, an Anna someone else did a really interesting study on in Germany where some of the strategies were perceived by professionals as really suitable, of these sort of example strategies, whereas some, some others were strange in the German setting, which would be okay in the US or, or in England. Well, how do you, when you teach in, in international settings, uh, how, how do you think about this? this like translate, like, yeah, how do you teach this? <laughs> <laughs> what I'm trying to do, moving across uh, cultures, is first empower the interviewer to, to learn some more what would be effective in their own context. Uh, they know best uh, what children may experience with, in response to um, different strategies like this. Um, so, because we don't have clear research yet on that, we have in research on, on American society, North America, Canada, uh, and Israel. Uh, and in other parts, we have implemented the RP but not tested it. Uh, so, uh, we, we don't quite uh, provide strict guidelines about how to adapt, but interact with the interviewer and empower them to to be creative with uh, adapting the the strategies to their own culture. Also, it might be a bit tricky because um, I mean diverging from the proper wording of uh, a, a supportive statement can make it suggestive. So we are here to make sure that it doesn't become suggestive. Any other questions? Yes? Yes, I have a question regarding this emotional support strategy. So uh, we elicit some negative emotions from the child or some negative behavior like the child is cutting and uh, we discuss about that. But sometimes I find it difficult to get out of this discussion and situation and continue with the interview. Moving from the discussing the emotional part of, of, of the emotion or the misbehavior and continuing the interview, mm -hmm. this transition to going back to the interview. Mm -hmm. And since we have limited um, resources by the child, I mean uh, attention resources by the child, we want to focus first on the investigation and not just on exploring emotions, of course. But when I speak about exploring emotions, it is mostly emotions toward the interview and the interviewer. So any emotions, on, especially negative emotion, that may become a barrier in the interaction with the interviewer, we must stop the interview and clarify what is happening and how we can go on uh, to the rest of the interview. We are supposed to give some feedback, but not necessarily explore any, uh, uh, every emotion that is expressed to our past events. Uh, so there is some um, gentle balance and 
uh, intense between the need for making a, an effective interview than caring for the child's emotional state. Can we think together what can be done when a child remains reluctant despite a supportive interview? So we have coped with uh, the reluctance of the child, we gave as much as possible support, we active to his concerns and needs, still the child wouldn't disclose. What are we supposed to do when we have no allegation by the child despite all the interventions described? Plan another session? Yes, yes, this is something we have tested. Thank you. Yeah, plus, uh, plan another session. Um, uh, this is what we could have done. And we have tested in two different tests um, how would children, reluctant children, uh, we act to a second interview uh, to found that children in a second interview build rapport much more effectively. Actually, we could say that rapport accumulated across interviews and was more meaningful in the second interview. Uh, consequently, consequently, we found another a large portion of the children describing the second time for uh, while they were quiet in the first time. Um, then we looked into the uh, into the dynamics, and we could see that actually what happened in the first interview was affecting what what the child described in the second interview. So uh, it made clear that when children got more support in the first interview, even though they remained reluctant in the first interview, but in the second interview, the outcomes, the outcomes were clearer and children were more willing to, to disclose. Yeah? Uh, my, my question is related to uh, if when we are planning the second session, uh, should we give the caregiver some instruction on what uh, on what to talk with the child until the second session, or we don't intervene on that? You mean what happened in between? Yes. What happened? Uh, okay. Uh, we don't really inquire what happened in between, but we signal to the child that we already know some information on him. So when we be continue building rapport, we don't start from start. We uh, already notice. Uh, we already m we mentioned that we know about his liking of computer games, uh, and if he can tell us some more about the computer game that he played with during the weeks or the week that between the interviews. So we signal that we remember everything that was said before and we build on the rapport already established. We don't inquire the, the child about things that may have happened. Uh, and many of the children actually didn't tell their parents about the first investigation, perhaps because they didn't realize it was an investigation. So the model of repeated interviews was such that only the rapport building phase was done. And when we saw no improvement in building trust and rapport, we just stopped the interview in this phase sometimes adding one or two open-ended questions. But if the child wouldn't react to that, so we didn't move, we didn't move on to more specific questions to raise an allegation. Thank you very much. Thank you for okay. an exceptional talk. Thank you. Thank you for listening.